So yes. next speaker is, is Daniel Brunner. So it's, it's my pleasure to introduce his talk about uh, 3D uh, photonic networks. Uh, so Daniel, please take control and share your screen. So, okay, screen is shared. Right? Can you hear me? Can you hear me, Claudio? Uh, we can hear you. Ah, good. Okay, and then I hope you will hear, see my slides. If not, uh, someone can interrupt me. So, um, <clears throat> yes, uh, this will be my uh, second contribution to this workshop. And uh, after the general introduction to reservoir computing or how to do neural network computing with uh, physical substrates with a focus on photonic substrates yesterday, I would like to show you some of our most recent developments, um, which is regarding the 3D integration of photonic uh, neural networks. And uh, the main argument here is scalability. And I already highlighted this yesterday that uh, in my point of view, scalability is pretty much the breaking point for, you know, for, 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 for a really relevant uh, computing concept and substrate. So I mentioned this uh, slide again uh, already yesterday. So as uh, before, it also serves here as a motivation, which essentially points out the uh, energy consumption of neural network computing, which is running out of control. And uh, the, its association also with uh, the gigantic electricity bill associated to this computing concept. Uh, this slide I also showed in one or the other way yesterday, where we have here a combination of all the electronic computing substrates, and we see that uh, across, so this really is uh, actually six orders of magnitude. So across six orders of magnitude, we see that essentially any computational electronic system, either for the very low power consumption range for local uh, sensors, for example, two of them, very, very high powerful uh, data center uh, server racks to do machine learning. All of them essentially consume the same amount of power um, uh, per operation, per fundamental operation. And essentially there is around uh, uh, two to three, four orders of magnitude difference between our electronic substrates and what is potentially doable in the brain. And uh, yesterday I made the, uh, or I pointed out that essentially this is because a neural network per se is a bio biology inspired concept coming from biological neural networks. And it's almost orthogonal to the principle of computing, which uh, we used as a, as a optimization target for all of our silicon electronic hardware substrates. So to show you a little bit the effect and to use this a little bit as a cliffhanger, uh, here is a, a video which I got from a collaborator in a project, Simon Thorpe. He is a theoretical neuroscientist. And uh, what you see here is first just a random scene. And uh, within that random scene, there will be sometimes objects uh, which do not belong to that scene. And I hope the video is, uh, or the, 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 the Zoom link is of high enough quality and essentially I just want you to watch that video and just see how many times do you spot something weird in one of these frames. Um, and the crucial bit here is that frame rate is very high. So it is uh, uh, a couple of frames a second. And within that frame, like in this last one, you have then a tiny, tiny object which really doesn't belong to the scenery. And I think all of you would have realized that these uh, 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 objects are always human faces. So what you have been capable of doing in the background without even me telling you precisely what to look for is you have analyzed a megapixel image and you've identified somewhere in that image a object which doesn't belong to that scenery and you've done that on a, uh, a data rate which is almost at the physical limit of what your brain can do. And that already tells us a lot what is a very fundamental property of the human brain. And uh, since they are the structural inspiration for neural network, 
also for neural network uh, concepts. So, and that is essentially the temporal response. If you look at the time scales of uh, biological neurons, and if we accept that that essentially has something to do with computing, whatever they do over time, then we see that they have a typical response time of tens to 100 milliseconds, it depends. And now if you want to make a decision uh, 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 making problem, if your brain is solving a decision making problem that actually information which is recorded by your retina of the eye propagates along the visual nerve and from there it bounces along several um, uh, areas inside of your brain until essentially that high level decision making process is done. And you can, pro uh, you can quantify the delay of reaction time uh, uh, by essentially putting people in front of a screen and giving them a buzzer and essentially then giving them different tasks. And what was found is that this reaction time is starting somewhere at 250 uh, millisecond and it uh, then increases depending on the task complexity. So for example, did you see a human or not? What was the gender of that human? Was that, uh, that uh, human famous or not? Et cetera, et cetera. You can see how essentially that response time uh, uh, gets larger and larger. But the fundamental interest here is that if you check out that uh, response time of a neuron and then you consider that just fundamental physical propagation delays such a signal needs to go from one of these zones inside of your skull to the next one and then reach your arm so that you can press a button, that essentially shows that computation is done almost whenever a first spike arrives within one of these cortical layers. That means that the computing architecture is completely parallel and there's almost no serialization, no averaging going on. The signal just propagates through the physical system and then the answer comes out at your finger or the, the reply with, uh, uh, in, 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 in uh, agreement with your thought process comes out of your hand after exactly the physical propagation delay. So that's a very important fundamental aspect because that means that the brain really operates uh, or is capable of operating at the physical bandwidth of its uh, atomistic components if we say that is uh, the neuron and that is only possible if the entire architecture is fully parallel. Besides speed, this also has a, a, a gigantic impact on the energy consumption and that ultimately uh, they are linked to, to time scales, but that is really what is limiting our technology right now. So this is uh, quite a uh, 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 theoretical work. If you're, uh, as a physicist, at least you always say, ah, biology, they are not quantitative science. They don't put error bars. Um, this bra basic brain facts are from some papers here from, uh, from Lenny 2003. It is considering uh, the measurable energy consumption of, I think, a mouse or a, a rat neuron. And then makes analogy that essentially functionally, there's essentially no difference between the two types of the neurons. What you have is uh, different volumes and that then is used for a, a prediction to upscale such neurons and how the capacities changes around the membrane, et cetera, et cetera. And with this, they come up with quite accurate estimations of what is the energy cost of one action potential fundamentally. And importantly, if you here have a, a scale of energy consumption um, for the whole brain versus the spiking rate, the average spiking rate of a neuron per second, and that one you can actually determine quite well, then you see that you're working within a very small margin, margin because that means here, uh, um, uh, this is essentially then for that rate, this model assumption uh, corresponds to the energy consumption we can measure for the human brain, and these are physically quite realistic values. If you would only have a factor of 10, then essentially the brain would use the energy of the entire body. So that means that the error margin here is rather small. And the consequence of that is that spiking and signaling is essentially 90% of all the energy consumption in the brain. And the neocortex uses around half of the brain's energy. And in the neocortex, we say we have the high level uh, computation going on. So there is really negligible emulation overhead going on. This here is really all what we associate to spiking and signaling 
Of course, then you have the rest and uh, inside of these pentameter sense is what is used for learning and other things like, for example, keeping the brain uh, from dying. So this just shows how efficient this implementation is. The brain does nothing else but to send signals around according to certain uh, 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 principles. And out of these uh, uh, signal properties comes all the amazing uh, uh, computation power we have. So. That means the brain is so good and so efficient because it just uses nothing else but its substrate. And this for me is really the crux, how we can really reduce all of this uh, energy consumption where we essentially are starting to melt the glaciers by using a computing substrate, which is not really uh, accustomed to neural network computing. So as I pointed out yesterday already a little bit, for me, the core importance uh, to start with is the networks mostly because uh, uh, the complexity of the network scales of order n squared, where n is the number of neurons, where, for example, the uh, energy cost for nonlinear transformation only scales with n. So in uh, 2017, we had some publications in Nature Photonics. Uh, most likely this, or mostly this was all um, kicked off by uh, Bert Chen from the MIT uh, group here, where they used a something called a unitary uh, multiplier uh, in photonics realized by a meshes of Mach um interferometers where you could use phase shifts in order to change uh, the uh, unitary matrix. So a unitary matrix operation is a, 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 a multiplication of a matrix on a vector which preserves the norm of the input vector. So essentially the amplitude of the input signal is the amplitude of the output signal but you can essentially do the rotations in the n-dimensional space arbitrarily. And that's exactly what you should do between the layers of a neural network. So this here is a really, it's, a, it's an amazing unit. And this is one of the most interesting concepts in photonics in my point of view, because essentially this allows you to do everything what is linear in photonics if you use it well. The problem is if you use this mesh of Mach sender, you have a very, very unfortunate uh, scalability of the problem. So here you can see this is state-of-the-art silicon integration technology. And here we have four inputs and they're converted into four arbitrary outputs. And that all is done in the, essentially an area of one millimeter square. If you look at the brain at a very, very, very uh, hand-waving approximation, the brain does the same thing in the same area for 120,000 neurons. So that already illustrates a problem. The bigger problem which we are facing is that if we want to use this technology and scale it up, then this scales quadratically. So that means as soon as you talk about tens or hundreds of neurons, you're essentially talking about an integrated photonic circuit the size of a, uh, you know, of, a, of a desktop. And that certainly is not what we have in mind. So the brain again, found a very, uh, or uh, you should not say the brain, but uh, evolution found a very, very interesting approach to this. And essentially, if you look at the cross-section of a human brain, or um, as a matter of fact, most bio biological brains, what you see, you see something called gray matter and white matter. Gray matter is essentially the, uh, the, the cross-sections I've shown you yesterday in this hand drawing by Ramon Cajal. It's very densely packed by a lot of neurons. And these neurons inside of this sheet of gray matter, which is wrapped around the wrinkles of the brain, they have very short range connections. They're very densely connected, but all short range. However, the long range connections, they go through the white matter, which is the volume of the brain. So that means you have short range communication implemented in 2D. And all the long connections are implemented in 3D because they go through the volume. And this here is real uh, uh, data using vector um, functional um, um, ma magnetic resonance uh, uh, imaging. And you can see these are essentially the communication highways from different zones of the brain to the next one. And I think this is uh, where, where, again, we can learn a lot from the architecture, which was optimized during, oh, I don't know how many millions of years of evolution, essentially, 3D connections are scalable if we distribute the neurons and the short range connections in 2D, but the long range connections, we distribute them in 3D. Another recipe we find in a neuronal connectivity 
is that the long range connections are done according to a fractal or a scale free uh, branching structure. So a bit, little bit like if you look at natural river flows when they go into the uh, into the um, uh, into the sea, you see them often branching out like this. Or if you look at the branching patterns of trees, and there is a, a, a very a fundamental uh, uh, symmetry rule. Underneath this, it is because these fractal branching are very, very efficient to distribute uh, whatever it is, water or nerve signals, or, uh, uh, or, or, or uh, to cover a certain area with tree leaves uh, with a very resource efficient manner. So, and essentially, what I would like to use is leverage these concepts to implement a, a photonic computer, a photonic neural network, where you would say, okay, here I have the layers of neurons. They're connected via some 3D block of connections. And we send in the signal, it propagates fully parallel. It distributes across uh, according to the topology. And then at the, out, you have, at the output of the signal, you have uh, the green light when this is in F. And uh, these fundamental kind of ideas to motivate in a canonical architecture here in, in this article last year. So the fundamental challenge we face is that essentially all of our high uh, performance fabrication technology is 2D. So, for example, if you want to do a 2D routing, which is fully in parallel and not based on serial switching, because by now I think it's clear that serial routing is very inefficient in terms of uh, uh, speed, anyway, in bandwidth, but also in terms of energy, it is very useful in terms uh, or very efficient in terms of space. So, if you want to do 2D routing in parallel, then what you typically use is a crossbar array where you have here an n-dimensional input vector uh, mapped to an uh, n o-dimensional output vector. And then you need always, and it doesn't matter if this is wavelength division multiplexing or any other scheme, the weight, the physical connection requires an area or volume where it is represented. And that is the same, for example, in holography, you require a volume element in order to define something. So it always uh, scales in volume with V3 or with uh, areas uh, with uh, the area two, um, if you're in 2D. So that means to connect a number of input output channels essentially scales very poorly with area. If we implement this in 3D, then we get the linear scaling. And this is essentially what we want to le leverage. And this here is not for fractal distribution. This is simply just to uh, basically associate to each input channel one plane to make the routing to the output channels. And then we have linear scaling of area with the number of input, but also of the height of the whole circuit. So how we do this is we use a technique which was developed a couple of years ago uh, called photonic wire bonding, where you use direct laser inscription of a, a, a solid structure in, inside of a liquid resin. So you have a liquid resin, which is essentially a, a, a collection of monomers, so very short chain molecules. Inside of this resin with a high in A, you focus a uh, femtosecond high intensity laser beam or laser pulses. And then within that voxel of the focus, um, what you get is you get a transition from the monomers, they link up to very long polymer chains. And that by, by that process, they solidify. And this process is by now uh, uh, commercially uh, available with a variety of companies. Here we are using a nanoscribe uh, uh, system. And with this, you can write pretty much anything from the sky scale of uh, 300 nanometer feature size to you know, much larger. That is the fundamental limit. So we did this to 3D print optical waveguides. Uh, where we started first with simple uh, uh, splitters. So you can imagine this one here would be our input channel or the output of one neuron. And then that would be the dendritic tree where the signal then starts branching out. So here you see a collection of one to nine uh, splitters where we have one input mapped to nine outputs. Um, however, as I showed before, you can do this in a fractal in a scale-free manner. So you can essentially cascade these uh, splitters in a scale-free manner, meaning that you just multiply exactly the same structure, and put it on top of it, but you multiply it by its branching degree. So here we have a branching in along one dimension of one to three. So if we now want to cascade it, we just put exactly the same structure, but multiply it in height and in width by three on top of it. 
And then already we have a branching of not one to nine, but one to 81. And therefore the degree of this connectivity scales exponential with the number of branching layer we implement. And with this, we can distribute an input signal or the value of a neuron uh, across a very large number of next layer neurons uh, uh, using a very small amount of volume and area. So here on the right side, you, we have essentially taken this a step further and we have written a interconnect for uh, 225 input channels onto, I, don't, I forgot the precise number of uh, output channels, but what you can see here is that instead of uh, doing a four by four matrix on a one millimeter squared uh, uh, substrate, here we do a 225 to 300 and something matrix on a uh, 200 by 200 micrometer uh, substrate. Of course, what I have to say here, we have no uh, uh, um, possibility to tune these connections yet, but this certainly has to be the next step. So we characterize the losses of uh, these early structures and essentially what we found was really promising for the one to nine uh, splitters, we found losses of uh, 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 2.8 dB. So on top of that, you have the injection losses, but if you would essentially butt couple this to lasers or whatever you want to use as optical neurons, uh, these can be reduced a lot. And here we have propagation losses of 1.1 dB and coupling losses. So coupling losses is essentially at these splitters of 1.67 dB. So that's really promising. This was essentially our first proof of concept. And uh, the beginning, we were really worried we will get 20 dB losses. So that was really, really um, um, uh, good news. Besides uh, uh, dense connectivity, what you also find in neural networks often is a, a more functional connectivity. So for example, if you want to look at convolutional neural networks. So in convolutional neural networks, you have early layers which apply convolutional kernels, uh, which are nothing else but local uh, matrix multiplication onto a certain area of an input. And these are essentially repeated for all the sections of the input. And that we implemented uh, with uh, a different 3D topology, which you can see here. Whereas in the previous one, you had essentially a mapping of one input to nine outputs. Here, we have a very functional mapping of the input, which are here the uh, bottom plane onto specific output channels, which are the bottom plane. So for example, if you want to implement Haar filter F2, so that means you will do a spatial filtering across this, uh, according to this uh, 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 spatial convolution kernel, then the output of that convolution will be provided at uh, this waveguide here. And essentially you can see how in 3D we realize these connections. And you can already appreciate here what we do is we provide nine convolutional filters for a three by three uh, 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 um, area of input. So all these filters essentially have a kernel size of three by three. And we provide all these nine filters fully in parallel at the output here at the same time. And you can see that if you want to implement this topology in 2D, um, I don't think it would be possible. So uh, it took us quite a bit to find a topology in 3D. Actually, it, uh, there was no intelligent design. We really uh, just uh, uh, combinatorially programmed uh, and saw how many waveguides will cross. And already in 3D, this was very difficult to find a starting configuration which was promising where you only had three or four waveguides crossing such that you can by hand tweak by shifting some waveguides up or down. So I'm pretty confident that in 2D, you could not do this. And the problem is that essentially you need as many layers as you have output. So if you want to do the same thing with 2D lithography, already you would have to stack so many layers that you lose all the attractiveness of the lithography and you can essentially go directly to 3D manufacturing. So how this works is essentially you can see here. So we want to have uh, uh, this input. So here you have to imagine this image, this uh, illustration being rotated. So that is filter F3, which I'm showing here. So that's rooted from that input to that output. And then here, I've always highlighted the different connection topologies of the three by three inputs to the output. So this, you can then, first of all, we characterize this optically. And again, you see there's quite still a lot of crosstalk, but that's mostly because we have uh, the losses at the in-coupling. So this, what you always see, this bright spot is essentially the light which is lost at the, at the uh, injection into the waveguides, this you can get rid of by 
essentially putting an, uh, an inverse taper on top of the waveguides. So we've characterized them optically and you see that they essentially correspond very well to the intended filter design. And then naturally you would not want one filter and slide the image across it. What you want is you print many of these filters in parallel and then you just inject the image and at the output you get the nine uh, uh, convolutional filters uh, just provided at the output plane. And this uh, you can see here um, we have done there. And that also was really, uh, really, really uh, positive results for us that it works already on this manner. Um, because what you can see here is a closer look of what happens actually with the fabrication. So if you fabricate these devices with lithography, what you start with is a very homogeneous and a very, very nice uh, raw material. Um, and then essentially you cut away from it. So that means where you're left with is very nice, uh, uh, if you ignore potential etching problems at the boundaries. If you do 3D printing, you construct its additive. And that means you essentially combine a lot of these voxels. And therefore, this is a very sensitive process when you, for example, look at the spacing of these voxels. So this here is uh, our starting design for one of these uh, uh, one to nine splitters. They look almost like the world worlds, these, these squids, these walking things. And what you can see if you increase, if you just double the, uh, uh, the spacing between the writing boxes in the XY plane, which we call uh, the hatching distance, then you can see that while here you have very small modulations, here you really see essentially every laser pulse, how it basically goes down and leaves behind one of these uh, stripes. So we then went on, we printed different structures, we looked at the performance versus the distance, the height was always kept constant. So here you see the individual. Uh, 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 constituents of the 1 to 4, 1 to 9, and 1 to 16 splitters. So, on the left side, what you see here is essentially our characterization <clears throat> using different writing powers. And I think uh, you see that the left and the right side essentially correspond very well. The writing power, therefore, seems to be a very, you know, not important uh, uh, feature. However, if you look at the hatching distance, and that is uh, the blue and the red line, then you see for the smaller hatching distance, you get much more, uh, 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 you get quite a significant impact. And blue essentially is the, uh, um, is, I think it's the smaller, the smaller uh, hatching distance, 100 nanometers. So there I need to check back if red or blue is 100 or 200. So you see here that for the different splitters, uh, essentially writing these structures with a certain power doesn't matter. As soon as you polymerize the, 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 the material, we are fine. However, the hatching resolution really uh, is an important parameter. And then we looked a little bit into what happens with the splitting. So here again, blue and red are the corresponding hatching distances. And then we look for the three by three and four by four splitter, what happens when you uh, 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 look at the different outputs of the, the splitters, because these uh, structures are essentially a polymer core with a refractive index of 1.5 and cladding with air, which is refractive index of one. So they have a gigantic refractive index contrast if you compare it to standard commercial fibers, which usually have a refractive index contrast of 10 to the minus two, 10 to the minus three. So that means propagation is fundamentally can be multi-mode. And therefore, if you split to the one to three or one to four, you don't necessarily get this very well controlled behavior. And you can see how really different subgroups of output legs behave very differently. For the three by three splitter, what is important in terms of symmetry is that you essentially have one tube which goes straight all the way through. And then you have a ring of tubes around it, which branch off at a different angle. So here you see that the percentage of the whole transmission for the central leg is by far dominant uh, across the, 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 the separation B0 because it's always the sum of these four. So essentially the central uh, uh, piece can have between uh, 50, 60% down to 10%. And yes, so uh, red, I think, I really need to check this, which one is the, the higher resolution. And when you look at the different peaks, then essentially the, um, the one on the faces or on the corners 
they have a very strong uh, difference between them as well. This even gets stronger amplified when we look at the one to four splitter, where we have essentially the corners furthest away of our inputs. In some, they only get very, very low uh, combined intensity, whereas the central four uh, get by far the most, which are you know always almost always above fifty percent. So that illustrates a fundamental problem, which is that uh, if we leave these uh, uh, waveguides being simply polymer core and air cladding, then we really need to control the propagation, or uh, uh, we will have to face multi-mode propagation and the consequences. So. Here is a little bit of waveguide uh, theory for some uh, cylindrical waveguides. I will uh, skip this because, uh, because of time, but this is really the, the absolute standard textbook behavior. What you have is some confinement factor, which essentially determines how much of uh, the optical mode is confined to the core and how much is essentially an evanescent field in the cladding. And uh, 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 as you increase the diameter, uh, you come across a threshold uh, um, where you then have really high confinement of the first mode, but you don't yet have confinement of the second mode. Essentially, that is the mono mode regime where the waveguide only supports single mode. And if you want to do this with uh, uh, the core polymer air cladding, that would mean uh, right now we have around with the 1.2 micrometer diameter of the uh, core which we are achieving right now, we have around 20 modes. If we want to go to a single mode, we would have to make a diameter of the waveguide of zero point, smaller than 0 0.5 micrometer. And that essentially could work in principle, but the problem is that these wiring or these, these, these routing topologies always face something which is the uh, aspect ratio. It means they are structured with a certain diameter and then a much larger length. And this re results in mechanical instability. And therefore, while in principle with this process, you can write something smaller or, or a, a narrower in diameter than 0 0.4 microns, for the structures we would have to print, this is not uh, realistic. But then there is a really advantageous uh, uh, process, uh, which is the polymerization efficiency. And that changes and that describes how much of the monomer is converted into polymer. And that depends on the power you use for writing the structures. And that in turn, again, influences the refractive index of the material. So that would mean we can write the core with a very high power such that we get a high refractive index in the core and we can write claddings with a very low power. And then in principle, we should be able to get a refractive index contrast, which is almost identical or comparable to optical fibers. And then we can very easily control the optical modes. So this is what we've done. Uh, we started writing a step index and graded index uh, waveguides in 3D and essentially changed the diameter. And uh, step index is essentially, we use a, a, a heavy side uh, a function for the writing powers. So the core has a certain level in terms of writing power, which is much higher than the cladding. And for the graded index here, the triangular symbols, what we do is we do a parabolic sweep of the writing power um, um, uh, for the core of our waveguides. And then here we can uh, measure the losses and we see then including injection losses, et cetera, et cetera, we drop quickly below five dB. And uh, we see that here we have a clear cutoff where the waveguide supports a mode well or not. And this for the step and graded index is very nice because we see here a factor of two, which is uh, exactly what you would expect from theory. And what we did here in this first characterization, we actually injected a optical uh, 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 spot, which was uh, had, had a much higher NA than actually uh, was supported by the waveguide. And the idea here was that we essentially excite many higher or we excite also the higher order modes should they be supported by uh, uh, the waveguide geometry. And you can see here, if we measure at several different locations, we look at the near field of the output waveguide, we see that here we have perfect single mode propagation for our waveguide, both for the step and the graded index. At a diameter of eight micrometer, we already get the LP11 uh, mode uh, for the step index. However, the graded index waveguide still remains in the single mode. 
Um, at 10 micrometer, we already get to the next higher order mode of the step index. And there the graded index is just at the transition between the two. So that means we can not only control more or less by diameter, we can control the numbers of modes supported by the waveguides and we can even tailor the refractive index cross-section of uh, our waveguides. So here we did a, a more uh, careful characterization. We injected the mode which we wanted to measure. So here uh, is the confinement factor, meaning how much of uh, the optical field is inside of our core and how uh, uh, um, um, relative to the overall uh, intensity of our optical mode. And uh, here we injected a LP01 mode and we got a LP01 mode at the output and then we measured the confinement factor. We injected LP11 mode and then measured the confinement factor of that and then LP02. And here you see uh, the uh, theoretical fit um, um, of these three measurements for all are fit, uh, fit at the same time with the same parameter. And here the NA is essentially the parameter which determines everything. So here we measured an, an NA for our current writing parameters of 0 0.07, which is around half of what you get for commercial single mode fibers. So this really shows that we have a very high degree of control um, um, of our uh, 3D printed waveguides when we go from this uh, polymer core to the air cladding structure. Apart from this, we also uh, determined the evanescent coupling between waveguides. So essentially, this would uh, could be related to the packing distance, how many waveguides we can essentially uh, pack into a certain cross-section area. And uh, we printed here uh, two waveguides for a, a proper co-propagation length of 300 microns. We injected uh, the fundamental mode in one and essentially measured the uh, uh, intensity distribution at the output. And uh, from this, we can um, um, determine the coupling uh, coefficient between them as a function of distance. And as expected by theory, the evanescent field of such a propagating mode is um, exponentially de uh, decaying with the, with the distance or the radius from the waveguide. And here we see how this uh, coupling essentially goes down exactly like that. And uh, more or less uh, at the separation between the waveguides of three to four micrometers uh, coupling essentially is negligible. So this more or less uh, determines how many of these waveguides we could put in direct vicinity and still maintain um, uh, uh, zero or a low cross of So this is what I wanted to show you uh, today. This is again the summary I showed you again yesterday. Here we, uh, I showed you what we do in the parallel, neural net in the parallel networks. Uh, and essentially what you can now imagine, if we use such arrays of micropillar lasers, which is another line of research we pursue in my group, and you print on top of them, you can, for example, print these 3D waveguides then we go a much closer step to uh, the vision I, I showed you before. Essentially, we have 2D layers of photonic neurons. They're interlinked to the next layer of photonic neurons with a 3D routing substrate. Then, of course, the next step is how we implement noise, uh, how we implement learning in such substrates. And yesterday, I showed you the example for uh, learning using digital micromere devices implementing uh, Boolean weights. And finally, what we also need to consider is actually what happens to noise, because if these neurons are noisy and they're connected in an analog fashion to their neighbors, of course, it's not like in digital computing where noise essentially is frozen. Uh, uh, you communicate a perfectly maintained signal and nothing can accumulate. So this is something which I uh, studied together with, uh, with Nadia and which I submitted an article. So here we did some work for linear neural networks of comprising of linear neurons and full connectivity. And now essentially we've extended this theory to using fully nonlinear neural networks, which even are trained using backpropagation. And what is the behavior of noise? What is the accumulation of noise? And what we find is really fascinating because it turns out that noise accumulation is always bound. Uh, um, after reaching this limit, you can add more and more layers to the neural network. The noise signal -to noise ratio will not get worse anymore. And as a matter of fact, if you use neurons with, uh, whose nonlinear um, activation function has a slope smaller one, which for example, for the standard sigmoid used in neural networks is given, then noise 
essentially does not accumulate at all. And the signal to noise ratio at the output is the same as the signal to noise ratio of the individual neuron. And uh, finally, again, if you're interested, uh, have a look at this uh, uh, conference here in San Diego. Thank you very much. So thanks a lot for the very nice talk. And it's, it looks to me that a new technology is emerging. I mean, the 3D photonic networks ranging from sources to connections, and this is very exciting. So I do not see at the moment uh, questions. Okay, you, can you see that, Daniel, or, or maybe? Uh, let me click there. Oh, I can ask Ivan to, to make the question, but I need a little bit to even, okay, here it is. So you, you want me to, do you want to? No, Ivan can do the question, I guess. Okay. <laughs> yes. uh, Ivan, can you speak or? One, two, three, can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you. Yes. Hey, Ivan. Thank you for, uh, hello, thank you for the answers for the interesting talk. Uh, I wanted to ask uh, how these parallel networks could be connected to other devices and also how brittle are these uh, parallel networks? So uh, other devices, you mean other than lasers? Yeah, and how to get output from the network. How, what do you mean how to get output? Uh, well, uh, this, net, this network is basically just a mesh uh, on, a, on a substrate. So uh, in order for it to do something useful, it, you need to uh, have some input and the way to get output yes. of this network. Yes. So, so it, I, I mean, essentially, um, of course, the, the, the principal motivation here is for an all optical neural network. So information would be injected optically. That's, for example, imagine you want to build a, um, a preprocessor for object recognition uh, for automatic dri automized driving, for example. Then essentially you have an imaging system injecting the, uh, the, the visual information into this mesh. That mesh gets then uh, basically linearly mixes the signal and injects that into another uh, optical nonlinearity. And then essentially you cascade these functional layers. Uh, to provide an output, um, I, I think, I mean, an output in electronics or you mean a trained output? Mm. Not exactly trained, uh, just what, uh, what gets out of this uh, network. So, so what gets out of this network is essentially that the answer of the system is encoded in the state variable you want to optimize. For example, power. Yeah? You want to classify, then you would imagine a network where you have 10, 20 output channels, which create a spatially weighted sum of the nonlinear transformations previously. And then the output with the largest power would be, for example, the classification result. Um, I, yes, I hope that answered your question. I'm not quite sure. <laughs> um, did it answer your question? Mm, yes, probably. Yeah, I think so. Thank I you. think we're talking a little bit in parallel. I'm not sure. <laughs> <laughs> Um, regarding how brittle this is, so I think uh, this might be uh, uh, brittle, might be positive or negative here. Uh, in general, if you write the individual waveguides until they are embedded in the network, they are quite delicate because what I said before is they have a very large um, uh, aspect ratio, so short, uh, small diameter, very long length. So mechanically, that's very bad. But if you start, once they are connected, so for example, this one to nine structure, once they are connected, they become quite, quite uh, rigid. And I think here, uh, uh, the one to nine structure, essentially they have a path length of 150 micrometers and the diameter is 1.2 micrometers. So they become, they become mechanically very sturdy. And uh, at the beginning, we were very worried about the mechanical uh, properties and stability, but actually, if you're careful during the writing, once the system essentially is this mesh, uh, it's very robust. Okay, thank you. I see a question from Diederik. Um, yes, Diederik. Yeah. Um, just a, a question. So, um, can you, uh, is, is, is the network capable of learning anything? So is there any modification of the network to, um, to change connections between uh, input and output channels? This is one question. Second question, is there any nonlinearity or maybe this is not needed? Uh, 
So uh, the first question is, 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 is more easy to answer. It's right now there is no nonlinearity because that's also not the idea. The idea okay. is that we have a nonlinearity in the 2D. So okay. for example, we take a nonlinear optical okay. substrate. Yes. Those are the neurons. And then this, this 3D object does okay. the linear vector vac matrix. Is there any the learning neurons. involved? So the learning right now, uh, not because it's uh, once written, it's there. Okay. Um, but uh, do you know this mesh of Mach sender interferometers I've mm -hmm. shown before? Mm -hmm. Sure. So, so essentially, uh, that is a long-term goal with, where we have to do the same. So what you would have to do is you need to modify uh, the refractive index between interconnect sections. And then via the interference, you can also program this uh, unitary matrix operation. But now it's scalable in size. But of course, that is... Uh, uh, that takes some considerable work, but th that is exactly what then, they're looking at. Okay, and then the learning would be in a change of the refractive index uh, to make the Marseille work uh, optically, not electrically. Exactly. Okay. I, well, optically, I mean, I think the easier for proof of concept would start electrically uh, because it's just easier to implement. But I think for sake of uh, uh, scalability of the concept and also the efficiency, uh, ideally, this would be implemented optically later. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. So we have some more time. Uh, okay. There is a, one question from Diego. I, so let me try to allow you to speak. Yes. Diego, I think you can speak now if you want. Okay, maybe if not. I can. I can also. Yeah, yes, you can answer. Uh, yes, if you. Ah, sorry, sorry, no. No, no, go <laughs> I, ahead. I have no problem when talking. I, the thing is that I haven't <laughs> muted myself, so. Okay. I no, 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 go ahead. I was speaking, but you were not hear me. Okay, just repeat uh, the okay. question. Yes, I would like to know if uh, you have characterized uh, because I read your your paper on noise and it was very very interesting. And I would like to know if you have uh, characterized uh, more uh, the, the noise in different type of hardwares, and if you have done so, uh, if this uh, noise depends, uh, I mean, if, if the noise changes a lot uh, between different implementations. Yes, so um, I'm not sure if I gave a talk uh, two weeks ago at uh, Photonics West where I only talked about noise. Uh, if you have access to that, uh, have a look there. The point is that there is some thermodynamical principles to noise. So let's say at least the, the absolute amplitude of noise, I think, is quite uh, generalizable. Uh, if, you're, if you spend a certain amount of energy per single unit, then uh, it doesn't really matter too much if you do this optically or electronically, or you use a Mach sender, or you use a laser. Of course, there is, uh, this is, let's say, an order of magnitude kind of argument. Then the type of noise uh, depends quite sensitively on what you use. So do you have additive noise, multiplicative noise? Do you have um, um, uh, correlated and especially uh, uncorrelated noise? These depend a lot on not only the components, but also on their let's say, um, how you operate them. If you have a network of lasers and you pump them with one common power source, then uh, the power supply or the pump laser, that intensity fluctuations will induce correlated noise across the neuron populations. And that has a very different impact on the noise propagation as if you have individual units by which just by Brownian motion do their individual noises. So, um, uh, to answer your question, I think the noise amplitudes, we can always say in analog, in analog uh, uh, signaling, it's quite easy to reach signal to noise uh, levels, which are compared to a six, seven, eight bit resolution with absolute standard techniques. You can get to a nine or 10 if you fight a bit for it. Um, if it's now multiplicative or additive, if it's correlated or uncorrelated, that really depends on the substrate. Um, I think what is interesting here is that you see that the electronic neural networks, they are actually pushing towards much lower signal resolution right now to save energy. 
Um, the good thing here is that uh, if you go to such lower uh, signal to noise ratios in, 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 uh, in digital electronics, you actually gain very little energy efficiency. If you do it, if you take this advantage and do the same signal to noise ratio in analog signals, you get a much better, uh, a much bigger payoff in terms of energy consumption. Yeah. So I think this is more or less the overview. Thank you very much for your, for your answer very detailed. Thank you. Okay, if no other questions, I, I would thank uh, Daniel again for the very interesting talk. And now we have uh, a break, uh, which is uh, our virtual uh, coffee break, or tea break, if you prefer. <laughs> and then we have uh, a new, in uh, the last uh, talk at uh, 11.30. So thanks a lot for, to Vidorik and, and, uh, and Daniel for the talks.